Thank you, George and Sarah, for joining me. What are the main points of dispute that arise commonly with freelancers? Two, two key areas of dispute, the first of which is fees. So what am I being paid as a freelancer? And nine times out of ten, the dispute is over what a day rate means. Very common to be paid on a day rate basis. What you need to be clear of is, does a day rate mean seven hours? Does it mean seven and a half, or does it mean eight hours? The second uh, area that's very commonly disputed is deadlines or timelines. So, for example, as a medical writer, you may be asked to return first draft by 2nd of July. But what do we mean by the 2nd of July? Do we mean the end of the day? Do we mean 10 a.m.? Do we mean noon? And what are some of the steps that can be taken before work has started to try and avoid disputes? The key thing that you can do, really, to avoid a dispute is to have a clear brief mm -hmm. and to issue contract terms. When you, when you find work for a recruitment agency, you'll be given an agreement to sign. But when you're working direct, you'll, you're best to have a standard checklist and a standard agreement. And what I actually always do when I have a brief is take a, a mental walk through the brief, think what could go wrong and where uncertainty could arise, and make sure that I've covered for that within the agreement. It doesn't need to be a very formal document or overly long. Just an email with, with clear bullet points is, is usually sufficient, as long as you both have a point of reference. And once disputes do arise, how best can they be resolved? Again, if you're working for a recruitment agency, your first point of call needs to be your agent. That's the person who has the relationship with the client and the person responsible for you. If you're working directly with the client, speak to, contact your immediate uh, contact, first of all. Mm -hmm. In either case, I always say talk. Ne be calm, be professional, accept mistakes that can happen, and you'll get a resolution. The worst thing to do is to fire off an email, because it just leads to misunderstanding and can antagonize the situation. I don't know what, yeah, what you I mean, think my, my, my strong but, feeling is just make up your mind that you will resolve it um, with the best will in the world. Um, you, the paying party, your client, is always going to be bigger than you. So if you, if, if it does turn into a major dispute, um, it can be very costly if you have to resort to um, legal assistance. So, you know, I think any conversation you go into, you have to go in with the intention of resolving it and be prepared to compromise. I think that's important. Now, freelancers tend to work either as self-employed workers or provide their services for a limited company. What would you say are the pros and cons of each? Okay. Um, I mean, legislation um, that affects both individuals and agencies has, has tended to tip people towards the limited company route. Um, pluses of, of limited companies um, tend to be that you can um, choose the timing of the tax breaks, um, so you can you can manipulate your personal tax to a certain degree. You can't reduce it overall. Um, you can reduce national insurance to an extent. Um, it's also um, a commercial thing. Um, we're very used to dealing with small limited companies in this country, um, so. People tend to perceive a limited company as being a, a real business and not everybody understands what a freelancer or sole trader is. Um, and, of course, there's limited liability, so that if something does go wrong, um, you're not going to be sued personally. Um, it'll be the company that's sued. Um, disadvantages of incorporation or working through a company and possible pluses of being um, a straightforward freelancer without the company are it's um, there are less layers of complexity inevitably working through a company um, you're involved with more agencies um, if you're and when I talk about agencies I mean government agencies so a freelancer that's not a company only has to deal with their own tax office whereas mm -hmm. companies deal with companies house and their own tax office, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and um, limited company accounts are actually put on public record at companies' house, although they're in a very abbreviated format that doesn't really provide any useful information to anybody else. 
Um, and I think that's about it, really. Um, yeah, a little bit more complexity with the company, but it provides more flexibility. Um, and then there's a whole tranche of legislation um, to do with personal service companies, which may actually prevent some people working as a limited company. And would you say that it's essential that freelancers consider certain insurances? Um, yeah, it's quite interesting that one. I mean, it's sort of um, it does depend on what type of what freelance work you're doing, um, and also what sort of status you're working at. So, are you working as a normal temporary worker for an agency um, on a PAYE basis, or are you working as a, a uh, direct as a self-employed worker, or are you working as a limited company? Through, through Some of that team? comes back to this: um, the benefits of working as a freelancer or as a self-employed person, because it's yeah. not necessarily a matter of personal choice. Um, you know, in certain situations, the revenue will look at somebody who thinks they're freelance, but if they are sort of working for the same client on a kind of nine to five, five day a week basis, um, the revenue will say that that person cannot be self-employed. They look like an employee. Now, if you take on the proper risks and rewards of, of working as your own business, um, then that's a good indicator that you know you are a proper freelance business. And one of the indicators that you you perceive risk is to actually take on the professional indemnity insurance. So it, it's just you know, one of the number of things that helps establish employment status or not. And what should freelancers be aware of regarding AWR? Just to define it, first of all, it it's, um, stands for Agency Workers Regulation. Mm -hmm. And it came into it's quite a complicated piece of legislation. And I think it's... And it's very to... new and it's very untested. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's still something that, um, I mean, it only came into force in October 2011. Yeah. And essentially it covers temporary workers engaged by a recruitment agency. Okay, so it doesn't cover the case where you get the job yourself as a freelancer. It's only when you're working through an agency. And it's really broad. I mean, it, it ensures from day one that an agency worker has the same rights to someone doing a comparable job at the same company. And the rights can be ranging from access to a staff creche uh, to being informed where to view permanent employment opportunities through to equal treatment in terms of pay and holidays after 12 weeks in an assignment. But the, we, Our feeling was that, um, in a way, it's not really going to impact um, freelancers working in a professional sector. Um, it, it's, it's very broad legislation which was really designed to protect um, low-paid agency workers in, in low-paid sectors. Um, so, I mean, in, in truth, in, in, the, in, you know, in professional sectors, um, freelance workers can often command higher rates. Um, than, than full-time staff. So I think, think the short answer is that probably in professional sectors it really isn't going to change things significantly at all. Well, Sarah and George, thank you both very much for your time today and thank you for your insight.